fortunate to have with us this morning Dr. Lynn Marie Trotty. And Dr. Trotty is the chair of our medical advisory board. Dr. Trotty is associate professor of neurology at Emory University in Atlanta. She graduated from Baylor College of Medicine and completed her neurology residency, her sleep fellowship, and her master's of science in clinical research at Emory University. Dr. Trotty's primary area of research interest is that of central disorders of hypersomnolence. She has completed two randomized controlled trials testing novel treatments for hypersomnolence and is currently funded by an NIH grant through K, uh, through K23. And um, that is to evaluate functional neuroimaging correlates for sleepiness and sleep inertia. We thank you, Dr. Trotty, for your overall groundbreaking research and for your commitment and contributions to our medical advisory board, to the field of hypersomnia research, and to the hypersomnia community. We thought that we would begin our presentations today with an overview of current treatments for excessive daytime sleepiness. Later this morning, Dr. Trotty is going to be sharing with us her most recent research. But right now, please join me in welcoming her to talk about current treatments. Good morning. Thank you for that introduction. So that was a fun talk to follow. I think, um, I think the message you're probably going to hear all through this weekend is this is a really exciting time. <laughs> there's, there's this sense of momentum um, and, and discovery and progress that, again, just looking back a few short years was, was not there. And so uh, that's really exciting. When I was talking with Diane about sort of what, what the program they were building looked like, I said, you know, maybe we need to sort of take a step back and say, well, separate from all these cool advances we're going to talk about all weekend, maybe we should sort of set the stage for where things are now and sort of what the conventional treatment options were. And so I said, you know, I, I can do that. I can, I can give that talk on conventional treatments. And then I was putting my slides together and I realized, like, I like talking about cool new stuff too. <laughs> and so I decided I was not going to stick with conventional treatments. I'm going to talk about conventional and probably not so conventional treatments um, all sort of rolled into one. Um, so that's, that's where we're going now. The, where we're starting is this. This is not one of those slides with animation where I'm going to like reveal different bullets underneath this title. That is the exhaustive list of all the treatments that are currently <laughs> approved by the FDA for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia. So that's a problem, obviously, um, and, and it's sort of the baseline for, for where we're starting out. So anything that anyone says about treatment for idiopathic hypersomnia is always off-label, meaning the FDA has not approved it for that use. I find myself saying a lot, some things are more off-label than others, um, but it is worth knowing that the FDA has not sort of acknowledged that any medications should be used for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia. But that doesn't mean there aren't treatments for, for idiopathic hypersomnia. I also like the apples and oranges comparison, so much so that I have the t-shirt. <laughs> but despite the fact that narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia are not the same thing, at least not narcolepsy type 1 and idiopathic hypersomnia, what we end up doing when we treat idiopathic hypersomnia is we use the toolbox that we have for narcolepsy because there are a number of drugs that are approved by the FDA for the treatment of narcolepsy. And note the FDA doesn't really care about the difference between narcolepsy type 1 and narcolepsy type 2, which at least for people with narcolepsy type 2 is, is helpful. So if you think about the medications that are FDA approved for the treatment of narcolepsy, they really fall in three big groups. There are these wake-promoting agents that are not amphetamines per se, but they work on some of the same chemistry. And those are things like modafinil and armodafinil, or provigil and nuvigil. And then there's a fairly big group of amphetamine-based medications, your ADHD medications, your Adderalls, your Dexedrins, Vyvanses, and so on. And then the third for narcolepsy is sodium oxabate or Xyrem, which uh, we'll, we'll get back to. And I think if you asked 100 sleep doctors, how do you treat idiopathic hypersomnia, they would all be very comfortable with that first bullet. 
some of them would be comfortable with that second bullet, and probably not that many of them would be comfortable with the third bullet, at least not yet. But these are sort of where we are, are starting from, especially those top two bullets. So, not very many years ago, when I gave a talk like this, I had to say there's never been a randomized controlled trial of any medicine ever for idiopathic hypersomnia. Randomized controlled trials are important. They are a gold standard for showing if a drug works because you randomize who gets what, which means you can get rid of things that sort of bias study results because it's just chance that's determining who gets what. And they're controlled generally with a placebo, so you know that the benefit you're getting is not just a placebo effect per se, but it's really the effect of the drug. So randomized controlled trials are really, that's the gold standard, that's what we want for every drug that we use in, in medicine, although we don't have them for lots of drugs we use in medicine. Um, and, and so really, that's what we need in, in IH. The first drug to be published as a trial, uh, as the trial of which used patients with idiopathic hypersomnia, there were actually three trials all started at about the same time with IH patients, but the first one to be published was this one, and it was looking at modafinil, so non-amphetamine, wake-promoting agent, and the first trial was actually, it was done in Europe in response to the EMA saying, you shouldn't use modafinil for idiopathic hypersomnia, which is a big problem, because that was the only drug people had been using for idiopathic hypersomnia. And so they did this trial just to say, no, look, we really need to use modafinil for idiopathic hypersomnia. And so it was a combination of patients who had either idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy with cataplexy, or narcolepsy without cataplexy. Um, and because they wanted to look at some driving measures, they also included controls who weren't sleepy at all. They didn't give those people um, modafinil. And they measured sleepiness with a test we call the MWT, or the Maintenance of Wakefulness Test, which is sort of like the cousin of the MSLT that you saw on the coffin earlier. The MWT, um, so the MSLT, many people in the room have had one. Uh, there's multiple times during the day where you're told to lie down, close your eyes, and try to fall asleep, right? That's not really what sleepiness is. It's not um, falling asleep quickly when you try to fall asleep. Um, at least that's not what the problem of sleepiness is. The problem of sleepiness is not being able to stay awake, right? And so the MWT puts people in a dimly lit room with nothing to do and says, stay awake for 40 minutes four times during the day. We actually don't do it very often because it's really painful um, to spend 160 minutes not doing anything except fighting to stay awake. Um, but it's useful for seeing effects of medication. And so it's sort of our gold standard of saying, did this drug improve the ability to stay awake? <coughs> and so that's what they used in this study. And so the, the y-axis there is basically how long could people go before they fell asleep when they were trying really hard to stay awake? Um, and basically what you see, oop, nope, okay. What you see is um, in, the, in the control group, not everybody can actually stay awake for 160 minutes when they're trying to. Um, it's normal to fall asleep near the end of that 40 minutes. Um, but there in the middle, when you take the hypersomnia and narcolepsy patients, um, it's really hard, unsurprisingly, to fall, uh, to stay awake when you're, um, when you're trying to. On the far side there is the sleepy groups together on modafinil. And so what you can see is that modafinil definitely makes it easier for people to stay awake, but it doesn't make it as easy as it is for controls. So it helps people stay awake, but it doesn't get people to normal in terms of the ability to stay awake. The other thing they were really interested in this study was safety from a driving standpoint. So we know that unfortunately people with hypersomnia are more likely to have car accidents. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to make difficult decisions about when it's okay to drive and, and how to do that safely. So. In this study, they had people drive for 140 miles in two hours on a highway, and I'm sorry, 160 miles <laughs> in two hours on a highway, and they measured how often they drifted across the, um, the dotted line um, of the lane, which obviously is not a good thing. Um, 
And, you know, fortunately, the numbers on the y-axis here are relatively small. People aren't crossing the dotted line a lot, but arguably even once is one too many times. Um, and, and what you can see is now that the axes are, or the order that they're presented on the x-axis are, are reversed, and so the controls are on the far side. Um, on placebo, uh, people with hypersomnia or narcolepsy were significantly worse at staying in their lane. Modafinil made them significantly better at staying in their lane, but modafinil did not make them as safe as controls at driving. So this was sort of a combination of good news and disheartening news all wrapped into one. Um, it helps. It doesn't help enough. At about the same time, another group was doing another study of modafinil, also in Europe, um, to look at it. This group limited the study only to people with idiopathic hypersomnia. So the prior study mixed in hypersomnia and narcolepsy patients sort of for convenience sake. In this study, they said, no, we really want to look at idiopathic hypersomnia only and see. They decided to only include people with idiopathic hypersomnia without long sleep times. So people with idiopathic hypersomnia who are sleeping between, or are sleeping fewer than 10 hours a night. That obviously is not the reality for everyone with idiopathic hypersomnia. There's probably some important differences in people who sleep a lot, you know, sleep 12 hours versus people who sleep nine hours. Uh, but for whatever reason, this was, this was limited to those people without long sleep time. The prior study I showed you was a crossover trial, which means everybody got placebo, and then separately everybody got modafinil, not necessarily in the same order, uh, which is nice, because then you can say, in this person, what did the drug do? Most randomized control trials actually give half the people placebo, half the people the study drug. Those are called parallel group trials. Um, they have sort of different statistical reasons you might choose them, but, but for what it's worth, this study was a parallel group design, so a little bit different from the last one. So half the people got placebo and half the people got modafinil. In this study, they only went up to a dose of 100 milligrams twice a day, which is a pretty, I mean, it, it's half of the maximum dose for, for modafinil. Um, it's a pretty low dose of modafinil. They were worried about side effects. Um, because of some of the EMA issues that have been going on uh, over in Europe, and so that's why they limited it to this dose, but they probably obscured some of their ability to find a result. And they used that MWT, that sit in the dark for 40 minutes, four times a day, and stay awake test. Um, and that's what you see over here on the right-hand side, um, which basically what they saw was on the low dose of modafinil, people with IH were better at staying awake than they had been before the study started, but actually they couldn't see a difference from placebo, because the placebo group also got a little bit better um, at, at staying awake. Where they did see a benefit was on the Epworth sleepiness scale, which I'm guessing people in this room are very familiar with the Epworth. That's that eight question, how likely are you to doze off when you're sitting quietly after lunch, when you're lying down to take a nap, and so on and so forth. It is our, our best, sort of most widely used, in any case, measure of how sleepy are you that you can report to me on a questionnaire. And what they found was that compared to placebo metafinil, significantly improved sleepiness among people with idiopathic hypersomnia who took it. This is not a like shocking finding um, by any stretch of the imagination, but because it was the first time this was shown relative to placebo, it was important to say you know, our clinical experience is one thing, but this is the actual evidence that supports that it's the modafinil that's having that benefit. <coughs> the other reason that that's really helpful uh, to have randomized controlled trials is that because of that first slide that I showed you, that there's nothing FDA approved for idiopathic hypersomnia, um, many drug companies will not pay for anything for idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, which is obviously also a problem. Um, sometimes, this is not universally true of insurance companies, but um, every once in a while it's true of an insurance company. If you can appeal a denial and say, look, there are two placebo-controlled trials that show that this drug works for this disease, science, then the insurance company will say, okay, we'll pay for it. Like I said, that's not most insurance companies, but that is some insurance companies. And so it helps to have those trials, know about them uh, when trying to get medication denials 
overturned. What about our modafinil? So modafinil is actually not one drug, it's two compounds. So if you think, I, well, I can't really show you this, my hand, okay, everybody hold up their hands. Yeah, so, so your hands are mirror images of each other, but, but non-superimposable. You can't superimpose them on, the, on each other, right? So modafinil is two things, and they are those mirror images of each other. There's a right side, and there's a left side. R, modafinil, is just the right side. So modafinil is both hands, R modafinil is just the right hand. This means they're really similar in their clinical effect. They are not identical. It turns out that the, the duration of the sleepiness improvement that you get with these two drugs is a little bit different. So most people who take modafinil have to split the dosing twice a day, one first thing in the morning and once around lunch. Um, whereas with our modafinil, most people can get away with taking it once a day because it lasts longer throughout the day. But otherwise, the effect should be fairly similar. Um, we don't have randomized control trials of armodafinil in idiopathic hypersomnia, um, but presumably the benefit is fairly similar. The other way you can look at modafinil as a treatment for idiopathic hypersomnia, you know, randomized control trials are the gold standard, but they don't really necessarily tell you everything you need to know about what happens in real life. If a clinical trial goes on for 12 weeks, Patients have idiopathic hypersomnia a lot longer than 12 weeks. And so it can help to look at clinical series to get a sense of not just did it work to make people better at staying awake in this dark room, but did it improve their life enough that they stayed on the medication long term? And what you see from clinical series like that of patients with idiopathic hypersomnia, about 200 people um, was all I could find published in the literature of uh, idiopathic hypersomnia and modafinil, is Almost two-thirds of patients with idiopathic hypersomnia who are put on modafinil for their idiopathic hypersomnia stay on it for the long term. So again, that's a good news, bad news kind of number, right? Like two-thirds of people who go on modafinil, that's great, and it works well for them, and they stay on it. A third of people, it doesn't, and that's sort of our gold standard for treatment for idiopathic hypersomnia. So, where most people go next after modafinil, if modafinil or our modafinil don't work or aren't tolerated because of side effects, um, are for the traditional stimulants, the ADHD uh, treatments and, and related. Um, there aren't any randomized control trials of any of these medications that included people with idiopathic hypersomnia. Uh, there are some clinical series of sleep center clinics treating people with idiopathic hypersomnia reporting how people did on these medications, they are very, very small. Um, and so for methylphenidate, there were 61 patients that I could find in the literature and about 40% of people stayed on methylphenidate with a good response. Not said explicitly, but most of those people likely tried modafinil first. For the combination of amphetamine and dextroamphetamine, I found eight people, <laughs> um, and 25% of people stayed on, on that with good response. And for dextroamphetamine, um, a whopping 15 people with a one-third uh, good, uh, good clinical response. Um, someday we could, I suppose, look at our population and get some bigger numbers than that. Um, but that's, that's sort of the, um, the landscape. For people who go to this second line of drugs, an additional you know, 30, 40% of people have some benefit, um, but that still leaves a lot of people without an effective treatment. And so if you look at these series in aggregate, and you look at these sort of standard of care medications, modafinil, armodafinil, and the stimulants, about a quarter of people with idiopathic hypersomnia don't respond well to these drugs or don't respond well enough to these drugs or can't tolerate these drugs because of side effects. And so we have a big problem. <laughs> we have a big job to find better drugs for that quarter of people who still uh, need a better alternative. So here's the unconventional part of things. Um, and this is where I have some interesting conversations with some of my uh, 
colleagues um, about, about what to do next. I think anyone who treats idiopathic hypersomnia knows this is a big clinical problem. It's a reason some of these meetings that Dr. Rye referred to are standing room only, because people really want to know how to help people with idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, but it's a little unclear yet how best to do that. So I thought I would talk for this section about things that are certainly not conventional, but that somebody has published about. <laughs> and so there's at least some sort of sense of, here's what I did and, and here's why. Dr. Rye alluded to some of the ongoing work um, with, with newer drugs, which is really exciting, because I used to have to tell people there weren't any clinical trials, and now I can say, oh, there's clinical trials. That's a big deal. But I'm not gonna talk about those that haven't been published yet. I'm just gonna talk about what has been published so far. So the third drug that I, that I talked about in, in terms of the, the algorithm for people with narcolepsy, but that hadn't really been used in idiopathic hypersomnia until relatively recently, is sodium oxabate or Xyrem is its, um, is its brand name. So sodium oxabate is an interesting medication. Um, it uh, is a medication that you take at bedtime, and then at least in narcolepsy, you wake up two and a half to four hours later, and you take a second dose. And the idea is people with narcolepsy don't actually sleep all that well, and they're sleepy the next day. And so sodium oxabate, among other things, improves people's sleep, makes their sleep more deep. It reduces daytime sleepiness the next day. It also helps with cataplexy. But it's a bedtime medication. Take it at bedtime, again four hours later, with the goal of improving sleepiness the next morning. <coughs> I really thought for a long time <laughs> that idiopathic hypersomnia patients should never try Um I was wrong, but I thought that for a long time. And I, and I thought that, I think, for reasonable reasons, which is that people with idiopathic hypersomnia already sleep really well, like arguably much, much too well, and certainly much, much too long. And sleep inertia, the difficulty with waking up, the needing the alarm clocks that fly, the having to have your spouse put cold water on you, um, in healthy people who have a little bit of that, we know that the deeper their sleep is, the more of that they have. And so for people with idiopathic hypersomnia, who have a ton of, of sleep inertia, a medication that increases deep sleep feels like it should make that worse. <laughs> so I used to tell people with idiopathic hypersomnia, look, we can try this if you want, but I don't feel great about it. I'm not that excited about the possibility because there seemed to me a chance that it would make things worse. However, my thinking, other people's thinking on this has certainly changed over the last uh, several years, in large part due to this uh, publication from Dr. Ar Arnolf's group in France. So the, um, the landscape for drugs in France is apparently different than it is here in the US. And so when patients had failed modafinil and patients had failed methylphenidate, that was like sort of the end of the road, apparently. And so they started using sodium oxabate because that was another thing to try um, to see if it would help with people with idiopathic hypersomnia. So what they did is they published, just from their clinical experience, about 40 people with idiopathic hypersomnia who they prescribed sodium oxabate to when other things weren't working, and they compared it to four, about 40 of their patients with narcolepsy who they treated with sodium oxabate to sort of see if the, if the clinical response was similar or if it was different. And it was surprising good news. So the first thing was that the idiopathic hypersomnia patients generally took less, they took a lower dose of sodium oxabate than the narcolepsy patients um, by over two grams a night. It was a, a fairly big difference in the dose. The reason why was mostly that, I mentioned with sodium oxabate, you take a dose at bedtime, and then you set an alarm four hours later and you take the second dose. <laughs> you know what people with idiopathic hypersomnia are really bad at? Um, waking up four hours after they go to sleep to take medication. So um, unlike most people with narcolepsy who took both doses, most of the people with idiopathic hypersomnia could only take the one dose at bedtime. So they ended up with a lower total dose. Despite that, their Epworth, that scale about how sleepy you are, improved as much as the Epworth improved in people with narcolepsy. Sodium oxabate helped with the sleepiness that people with idiopathic hypersomnia were experiencing. And 
this is a head scratcher for me, is sleep drunkenness. The difficulty with waking up in the morning got better with sodium oxabate in the IH patients. And so, um, so that, was really, that was really good news. And like I said, really changed my, my thinking on this medication. Um, of the people who got put on it for idiopathic hypersomnia after failing other medications, almost half of them stayed on it long term. So this is certainly a nice addition to our um, arsenal in terms of treating idiopathic hypersomnia. And as Dr. Rye mentioned, uh, Jazz is um, going to do a randomized control trial of a related medication in idiopathic hypersomnia. So that's really, um, that's really exciting. The second medication <laughs> that was studied in a randomized control trial for idiopathic hypersomnia was, was clarithromycin. And so the, um, I won't go through the whole sort of history of, of how this came about, but suffice it to say, we think GABA receptors are important for idiopathic hypersomnia. Dr. Jenkins is gonna talk all about that tomorrow morning, I think, sometime this weekend. Um, and so we have been looking for medications, and now others are looking for medications that affect those GABA receptors uh, that might be helpful for people with idiopathic hypersomnia. So this was the work that the American Sleep Medicine Foundation uh, funded. We um, had some clinical data. We used clarithromycin in our clinical practice, and people seemed to be getting better with it. Um, in terms of their sleepiness. So we really wanted to see, compared to placebo, if, if clarithromycin was helpful. And so we did this randomized control trial, and what you're looking at here is just the study design. We took 20 people, and it was a crossover, which means everybody got clarithromycin for two weeks, everybody got placebo for two weeks, but not everybody got them in the same order. Half of people got them in one order, and half of people got them in the other order. And then between the two weeks, there was a week with nothing, to, to get rid of any lingering effects of the clarithromycin before people went on placebo. A couple of notes about this. This was not only patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. The largest group of patients in this trial was people with idiopathic hypersomnia, but it also included people with narcolepsy without cataplexy, and it included people who we thought clinically had idiopathic hypersomnia, but their multiple sleep latency test was normal because it's a terrible test. So. <laughs> So people who have idiopathic hypersomnia and closely related and or identical diseases that have different names were the 20 patients who were, were in this trial. The other thing to note about this trial is the classic way to do a randomized control trial of a medication is to take people off any medicine that they're already on that's helping at all for the disease that you're studying. So that any effect that you see, you can say, my drug did that. The problem with doing that is people have to come off of whatever medications that are on that are helping it all for their symptoms. Um, and that's really a lot to ask of people who are going to be in your study. And so we, we went back and forth on that question quite a bit um, and ultimately decided we would rather have less ability to see a benefit of clarithromycin, maybe obscure some of the benefit of clarithromycin and let people stay on whatever medications they were already taking, then take people off and have them have to like stop working and stop driving and everything for the duration of the study. Um, so this is showing what does clarithromycin do versus placebo in people who are already on the best treatment they can find for their hypersomnia, but it's not working, or at least it's not working well enough. The thing we decide, you know, so when you do a randomized control trial, you put your money down at the beginning and you say, this is my primary outcome. This is the thing that I, that I really think is going to show the biggest change. And I'm going to say, this is the most important thing. Um, and then you say, I'm going to look at all these other things, but they're sort of my second favorite. Um, and <laughs> the thing we picked back then was how quickly people could press a button in response to a stimulus um, over a 10 minute period, a, a reaction time test. And the reason that we picked that measure is we wanted something that was like quantitative and hard evidence because certainly then more so than now, there was a lot of skepticism about IH and a lot of, you know, how do you really know that's whatever from some of our colleagues. Um, and so we really wanted some like hard numbers. So we picked the reaction time test um, as our primary outcome. And you know what? Clarithromycin actually didn't improve people's reaction times. 
Um, you can see sort of from the, the heights of those bars, it looks like it might have been doing something, but certainly we could not demonstrate that it was statistically better than, uh, than placebo. So don't take clarithromycin to improve your reaction time. Um, however, we don't think the trial was a total waste because all of our relevant secondary outcomes, um, here is shown the Epworth, but we also saw the same thing for the functional outcomes of sleep, which is basically a questionnaire about how your daily activities are limited by your sleepiness. We saw this for um, health-related quality of life related to sleepiness. Um, the clarithromycin significantly improves these measures compared to placebo. You get about a four-point reduction in the Epworth, um, which is certainly a size of improvement that we see in other clinical trials for other things that we think is sort of a clinically meaningful benefit. So clarithromycin helps with sleepiness. We still use a fair amount of clarithromycin um, in, in clinical practice. Um, I know I have colleagues around the country who, who do as well, because um, they email me about it a lot. Um, I cannot wait until the day that I write my last prescription for clarithromycin. Um, I hope it's when I'm like 45 and not like 75, but we'll see. Um, because clarithromycin is an antibiotic, and so there's a lot of baggage with clarithromycin being an antibiotic. We really need a drug that does what clarithromycin does that's not an antibiotic and preferably doesn't cause a bunch of GI upset and bad taste. So, that's where we get into the world of flumazenil and maybe some of these other drugs that are being studied in clinical trials, which is very exciting. Flumazenil also works on GABA receptors. Again, I'm guessing Dr. Jenkins will talk all about that tomorrow. Um, so I will stay away from the world of mechanisms. Uh, but, but suffice it to say, uh, flumazenil is a medication that is FDA approved for the reversal of certain drugs, the Valium family of, of drugs. And so the way that it's used clinically is through an IV injection. And it turns out if you give it to people with idiopathic hypersomnia who are sleepy as an IV injection, it makes them not sleepy for about two hours, which is good. <laughs> it was like two hours. But um, obviously you can't like give yourself an IV injection every two hours for the foreseeable future. Um, and so hence compounding pharmacies, starting with Pavilion, but you also heard from some of the sponsors um, of the conference as well, um, anything that the FDA approves for anything, <laughs> virtually, compounding pharmacies can put into another form, because you don't always want medications in the form that they are, that they are FDA approved. So, it would be really nice with flumazenil if uh, a compounding pharmacy could take the raw preparation and put it into a pill, and you could just swallow the pill of flumazenil, and then maybe it would keep people awake. Even if it only kept people awake for two hours, swallowing a pill every two hours, it's not great, but it's not that bad, right? Unfortunately, <laughs> flumazenil doesn't work that way. Um, there is a, a system in the liver that with some medications, if you take them orally, it will basically destroy the medication before it gets into your bloodstream. And if it can't get into your bloodstream, it cannot get into your brain, and it can't wake you up. And so it turns out if you take flumazenil as a pill, the liver will destroy 85% like of it before it gets into the circulation. So um, flumazenil is pretty expensive. You need like really, really a lot of pills to overcome that. And so what we have done um, is get it compounded into forms where you can get it directly into the bloodstream without going through the liver, without going through that, uh, that pathway that destroys so much of the flumazenil. And so you can see the two compounded versions here. Um, the, the taller thing is like a deodorant stick of uh, flumazenil that you can rub onto the forearms because if you look at your forearms, you can see actually veins right there. It's one of the few places in the body where you can get to the venous system without a lot of other tissues in the way. And so you can use flumazenil as a cream. It also it turns out there's a bunch of veins right underneath the surface of the floor of your mouth. And so if you put something under the tongue and let it dissolve, not swallow it, because then you've 
destroyed all the flumazenil, but let it, uh, let it go into those veins that are right underneath the surface, you can also get directly into the, into the venous system that way. And so the tiny little pink things right next to that dime um, are the little lozenges that are dissolved under the tongue for flumazenil. So we started using flumazenil, well, our first person we used flumazenil on just celebrated her 10-year anniversary on flumazenil. So um, that was exciting. Um, but for everybody else, there was a period of several years where we talked to the FDA a whole lot. Um, and then we started using flumazenil in, in sort of a more widespread way in about 2013. And so a couple years ago, now, um, we went back and we looked at the first group of people we had put on flumazenil to see how they did. So this was not a randomized controlled trial, this was just in our clinical practice, what happened. Um, at that time, we had treated 153 people with flumazenil. Dr. Rye mentioned earlier how many people have been treated. Now it's a much bigger number, um, but certainly back then it was 153. And we looked at it a couple of ways. The first was we looked at who said that flumazenil helped at all, like they noticed a benefit on their sleepiness. And then we looked at who thought that that benefit was enough that they continued to take the treatment long term. Those numbers are not the same, but uh, benefit of any kind was reported by 63%. So some people take flumazenil and think they're taking a placebo, cannot tell a difference. Uh, but 63% of people can at least feel something. The number of people who stayed on flumazenil um, was down to 39%. Um, the figure that you're looking at is the breakdown of why people didn't stay on flumazenil. So um, the biggest group, that big orange, is that it didn't help. Um, the next biggest group, the sort of teal color, is people still taking it, and then that little wheel of reasons why people stopped. Um, side effects, um, preferring clarithromycin, cost, um, honestly cost sometimes people, keeps people from trying it in the, in the first place, so I think um, if we included those, that wedge would be a lot bigger. Uh, rarely people developing tolerance over time than miscellaneous other reasons. Um, after our first person who's been on flumazenil for 10 years <laughs> went on flumazenil, you know, I think, think we were hoping everyone would have a response that was that um, big. 39%, um, I wish that number were 99%, right? Um, but that's 39% of people who had already tried modafinil and armodafinil and methylphenidate and dexamphetamine and amphetamine and this and that and the other thing, right? This is 39% of people who had already tried everything else we had in our toolbox. And so it's not nothing. Um, people's Epworth sleepiness scales um, of the people that we had it before and after treatment, or before and on flumazenil also, also improved. So those are, the, those are sort of what we have been using a lot of, but um, fortunately we're not the only people trying to be innovative in the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia. And so I wanna talk just a little bit about a couple of other things um, that are being tried. This was a, um, initially a single case report uh, that this group published, and then they followed it up um, a year or so later with this case series of patients. This is a group in Japan treating idiopathic hypersomnia with long sleep time. So these were only people who slept at least um, 10 hours at night. And it was nine patients. They all had normal thyroid function. Um, I, one of the first things gets checked, that gets tested when you say you're sleepy, especially if you're a woman, I think, is your thyroid. Um, many people, by the time they see me, have had their thyroid tested like 50 times. Um, because if your thyroid is out of whack, it can make you sleepy. This group of IH patients had normal thyroid functions. These were not people who were like, borderline, maybe it's kind of a little high. These are people who are normal, their thyroids worked fine. But the investigators reasoned, because the thyroid wakes you up, 
maybe if we give them a little bit of extra thyroid hormone, even though their levels are okay, they will get a benefit on wakefulness. And they r reported a really dramatic benefit. So on the left side, what you're looking at is the Epworths at before and then dramatic improvement by eight weeks of treatment. What you're looking at on the right is the hours of sleep slept per day started out as a at about 13 and ended up at about 9 or 10 for people. I was, re I was really excited when this case series was published, um, what feels like many moons ago now. Um, I, my clinical experience has not mirrored this. Um, I don't know quite why not, um, if there's something different about their idiopathic hypers hypersomnia phenotype or if I haven't done it enough. Um, I have a handful of patients who are on levothyroxin um, for their, their idiopathic hypersomnia. Certainly, I think it is worth a try. Um, I don't think everybody gets this level of a response. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about in terms of new treatments, Dr. Rai mentioned very briefly, there's a lot of interest in neurologic diseases and psychiatric diseases and brain diseases of any flavor in can we electrically stimulate the brain to reset some of this circuitry to improve symptoms of, of brain disorders. And certainly you can do that stimulation by like doing major surgery and implanting electrodes into the brain um, and stimulating that way like we do for Parkinson's disease and increasingly more and more things. But ideally you would have a non-invasive way of stimulating the brain that did not require major brain surgery. Um, and so that is where transcranial direct current stimulation comes in. The idea is if you can surf, if you can stimulate on the scalp, maybe you can still affect neuronal activity uh, all the way down through the other side of the skull. This was a series of eight patients with idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, and importantly, unlike a lot of the other studies I've talked about, these were patients who'd never been treated with anything. So these were people who were brand new after they'd been diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia. We don't know if they would have responded to modafinil or not, or, or any of the other things. So a little bit of a different group. In any case, they got simulated um, three days a week for four weeks um, with these little electrodes on their head. Um, and those eight patients reported a substantial decrease in their sleepiness. Seven out of the eight of them said they felt better with this treatment. Um, they had some improvements on an attention test as well. Um, this is not a therapy that it's always easy to access. Um, and this is obviously really preliminary. It's eight people who'd never been treated with anything else. Um, but as Dr. Rye mentioned, now there's a, a clinical trial that's enrolling patients to do this kind of therapy. I have a colleague up in Minnesota who started doing this with his idiopathic hypersomnia patients. And uh, although he says he's not ready to commit publicly to it yet, he, he thinks this, this might potentially be real based on his experience so far. So we will see. With that, I'm gonna stop talking for now. Do I have time for any questions? I have time for a few questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, doctor, for the great presentation. Um, question about side effects for the non-amphetamines versus the amphetamines. Uh, do you see a marked difference between those two groups of treatments? Yeah, um, great question. Definitely yes. So the um, the amphetamine family of drugs, we see m increases in blood pressure, we see increases in heart rate, we see palpitations. Um, for the non-amphetamine wake-promoting drugs, modafinil and armodafinil, they almost never affect blood pressure, they rarely affect heart rate, they can cause palpitations, but it's pretty rare. Um, and so from a cardiovascular standpoint, we definitely think the modafinil and the armodafinil are safer. So. Um, people who have heart disease, who have high blood pressure, we prefer the, the non-amphetamine medications. Um, they certainly can both cause the irritability, anxiety, jitteriness kind of thing. Modafinil and armodafinil are more likely to cause headache, and so actually that's the reason uh, most commonly, or one of the most common reasons why people have to stop those medications is the headache, which you tend not to see with the amphetamine-based medications. And Modafinil and armodafinil. I'm going to get this on a t-shirt also. Modafinil and armodafinil interfere with the effectiveness of birth control. So 
yeah. Um, so for women in particular, there's some decision making about, you know, do we use an amphetamine or a non-amphetamine in, in that aspect as well? Uh, just uh, one last question here, Bruce. Yes, enjoyed your presentation, thank you. Could you comment among patients who respond to modafinil, at least sufficiently they stay on it, how complete the response is? Do they remain troubled? Are they symptom free? Yeah, so it's a it's definitely a mixture of patients, you know, when, when people stay on modafinil, how often is that a complete response and how often is that a partial response? Uh, Dr. Rye mentioned earlier, it's really hard to draw population-based conclusions from our clinic because we see such a specialized group of patients. So I would say in my clinic, no one ever comes in and says, I'm completely better with modafinil. Um, but that's because people don't come to see me if they're, if they're doing well with modafinil. If you look at sleep centers in general and what they have published about modafinil, actually of the people who stay on modafinil, most of those people are considered to be complete responders. There is a smaller section that's only partial responders. But for that 63% of people who respond well to modafinil, a lot of those people, like, they're fine. The modafinil really does what they need it to do.